282 with or without canopy. Small amounts of volatile. Okay, yeah. let's go back. Do you agree with that? Yes. yes. Okay. Let's see. 282 plus 282 plus 282. So is there? They are right. Let me do right things now. Please stick it there. So the next one is what cabinet would you select if you want tech to be able to turn off the cabinet when it is not in use? Double one, two, three, double three. What are you on double three? Okay, sorry. I stand up I think for both of them, when you are not using 2A and 2B, you have to be careful. You have to it it what cabinet would you select if you wanted to be able to turn off the cabinet when it is not in use? Is there a cabinet that you leave on when it is not in use? Except for people. All of them have to do 2A That's why I want to be You said, what cabinet would you select if you wanted to be able to turn off the cabinet when it is not in use? When it is not in use? Anyone So the practice, the good laboratory practice is that when you are done with your work and it's not in use, what do you do? Those of you that use the That's why it's so Obviously, and then when you switch on, you switch on, then you leave it for a while. So we have answered. Our answer is all. You are the one answering. I'm not participating. So my friend is just us. You fail. Okay, yeah, totally. Number two, our answer is all. Is there anybody that is disagreeing? The eyes have it. What cabinet will you select for changing the bedding in animal cages if you want to minimize the odors in the room? 2B2. 2B2. Why will you choose 2B2? Exhausted. Exhausted. That is all. Let us think through. What cabinet will you select for changing the bedding in animal cages? When you're changing bedding in animal cages, what happens? What do you generate? Aerosol. 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 If you want to minimize the odors in the room, so as you're changing it, you know, you're generating aerosols, and then an odor is coming out, and then you want to minimize it. So which one would you use? To be two, because everything has to go out, so it doesn't enter into the room. You know, the A2 we said 70% comes in, 30% go out. So it's simple. Is there anybody that does it? It's not following. Are we all following? So I can put class 2B2. Great. For all of you. Atama get 
So let's look at proper BSC setup. How do we set up our, our BSC? Because somebody mentioned the in the I think the Adamu, not Adamu, we were talking about manuals. People should read the manual, and I also remember talking about SOPs. When you have a equipment, you sit down. That's why the, uh, the suppliers of equipment they will even send their engineers to come and train your people. They don't just come. And, that's why service agreement is very important. When you purchase. In service agreement, you put that clause. Some will agree to train. Some will agree to, they will mount it. They will kind of validate it before run it for a while, before they leave you. By that time, you have mastered the use. So proper BSC setup means that you have to, when you buy it, what do you do? You read the manual, manufacturer specification. So number one, allow cabinet to run Five minutes prior to use. Why? Where will you hear, get this information? It's from the man. And then some people may not. They want to preserve the manual so that not living through the manual every time. You tease out some steps from the manual and put it in a SOP. Okay. Disinfect work surfaces. This disinfection of work surfaces from what we have said between yesterday and today. Where does it fall into? Can somebody remember? Good laboratory work practice. You have to disinfect. When you come to work, you disinfect. When you finish work, you disinfect. And you use people. If you're the one working on the machine, don't call the cleaner to come and disinfect. At all. You say, no, no. It is you. You are the professional. You have some level of training and understanding of the things you're handling, the agents you're dealing with. Not this poor cleaner that is not even trained. So we allow our cleaners to clean our floors. We don't allow our cleaners to clean the work benches. Then you are manipulating all these things. You must remember this because this is a safety factor. And there are things people can take for granted. Oh, Nigerian style as usual. Please, moving forward. Because we are trying to save our own lives and the lives of family members and environment. Yes. Then you wipe. We don't the life of the cleaner. We can the waste for the life. Uh, exactly. Life of the cleaner. And every other last worker. They have some basic training. I think most cleaners have some basic training. They step down. It's, it's also good if you have enough. Uh -huh. In some places, they just restrict them to cleaning the floors and the meat cellulite or the clean areas, not the dirty levels. Okay? So you wipe off each item you place into the BSC to minimize potential contamination. You have to, you know, wipe as before you put it in. Arrange materials in the BSC to segregate contaminated and clean items. So let's look at the picture now. Though it's not very clear, but the second one, she's trying to set up, you know, yes. Oh, adjust the sash. You have to adjust so that you make sure that you know uh, why tell me why do you have to adjust those who use this because some people don't think about it. So these are certain small, small things that you read from the manual. So you have adjust it and uh, the ones are observed. You see a map, you know. So once you move it, it aligns them and then what starts with it. And, and we need to also adjust the map, the sash for efficiency in the operation in the BSCs. Secondly, for safety, mm -hmm. that it is not too high that is the and thirdly, for stability of the site itself, that it does not vibrate and does come down. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it does. Thank you. Yes. 
So these are all the things you need to do before. Okay, so and also remember this one that talked about the uh, let's just go back arranging materials to segregate. This area is clean, not just people, you know, sometimes you see people when they are working in their BSC, is a madhouse. You have to be more than clean area. So you walk from clean area to dirty area, move things like that, not from dirty to clean. So lay out of equipment, clean side, dirty side. So you can see this is neat, clean, organized, everything needed placed inside before beginning work. Not after working, you run out. You go and bring something. You go, okay, you can build this out. So, working in a BSC, you have to run now. Perform work at least four inches behind the front air intake grill. You know the grill. The grill, you know, once you open it, you can see some opening. You know, so, you have to perform the work at least four inches behind the front air intake grill. So if the grill is here, you're walking inside, not so that you don't cover this grill. Okay. Avoid unnecessary movement in and around the cabinet. So cabinet, we will get to the slide where cabinet is you know, situated, not close to the door as you're walking out. You know, you can be close to the door for that moment. Collect waste, pipettes, and contaminated materials in the cabinet. So there must be, you know, uh, a small waste container at the uh, uh, one side, let area, and then wipe down cabinet work surfaces when work is completed. So you wipe before and after. So the UV lights in the BSC, you can see the UV light, not recommended and limited effectiveness. If must be cleaned weekly. That's the BSC. I'll come back to this. Walls usually needed to be replaced regularly for the UV lights every 30 uh, 90 days of use. Must be turned off while the room is occupied. We are aware that UV light for its own it's not it's, it's, a, it's a safety issue. It is only when it is necessary, absolutely recommended, based on your risk assessment, that you will be Some people who start their they love the view, and they will make it, and they are walking there, and they are even exposing themselves to danger. Yes, so it's recommended when you put it on. There's a number of minutes it will stay. How many minutes now? Thirty minutes? One hour? It will all depend. Then you switch it off. So the biomedical engineer recommend now, even when you switch on this, you leave the room. On it, switch off the you and then leave the room. When it's time, then you come in and switch it off. That is their recommendation based on robust risk assessment. The harm, the UV risk, that costs to the worker that is trying to work. I want to say yes, please. Uh, from the risk assessment, mm. if we are we suggested that we switch of the uh, UV light. Beautiful. You see? No, that was the moon. The moon will be like not. She said how? She said from risk assessment. So you can see that what works for you may not work because maybe they are really small, and then even when you come and you are close, you may not even close over you are in the room, and they have accepted it, and it is better to not be outright. Okay. So, and that's why you, when they do some medical surveillance, if you see the checklist of the safety, our checklist of the safety assessment of lab, there's a section where, you know, yes, this, um, this question, medical surveillance, there are people like women or childbearing, they say, don't walk in places where, you know, that they use uh, UV lights. And then some will say, ah, we don't use that, there's no, it's not the x-ray and all that. They will forget that their PSC cabinet has, you know, uh, potentials because at this point, some of the things you're talking about. So okay. walls usually need to be placed, replaced regularly, okay, we said that, must be turned off while the room is occupied. Okay, we've already 
Limited effectiveness. Some people think that they can use this good light to sterilize the environment. So we keep saying, you know, you have to do an assessment. And you cannot assume because you feel like I can do some level of sterilization. Before you can even say, oh, I'm using it for this, you must also validate that process. You must validate that process. So it has limited effectiveness. So before you apply it to any system and say, oh, I'm using this for this, you have to also do some level of validation of that process to be sure that as you're even using it to sterilize this your PSC, there is no guarantee that, oh, I'm home and dry. You must have done some level of validation to show you that if I turn off this, you'll be protecting me. That environment is sterile in books. Understand that sometimes we just take things head, book, and center as if, oh, oh, we both said it, that's the way it is. No, that's why there is need for validation and also review. Okay, so they are not recommended, yes, they are recommended. We, we should use that, not like just go home, and go ahead. you must look at your system, look at what you're doing, and do some level of validation of your processes. Limitations of BSC. Only small quantities of volatile chemicals may be used in any type of BSC. Bottles on standard BSCs are not smart proof. So they can fire cartridges. And then look at the picture we are looking at. That is fire, a BSC that is caught by fire. And we don't know. What uh, caused it? Some people carry their little safety food and put it inside the BSC and they are uh, <laughs> should not use bouncing bonus or alcohol lamps in BSC. Over time, heat can damage the paper filter. So these are some of the things we must also take note. Yes, please. They still use the gas, but the electrician says they are even working with BSC. I don't know how that one is now. I don't use one for one and a half. They don't use one for one and a half. But know that if I were using it, the likelihood of is high. You can use it for five years, like uh, my brother here, and nothing will happen. But over time, it's affecting the effectiveness of your. Uh, Pepper filter. That, so have that behind you so that whenever you're using it, you need to probably use it for a certain a limited number of hours and then you know because there is a consequence. Mm -hmm. No, they're just telling you that heat can damage the pepper filter. So anything you are doing that generates heat, just get a fact that you do it briefly and fast. So what he described was okay. He said in the uh, describe it again. He's, he's, sorry, I'm coming. We are looking at he said over time heat can damage the pepper filter. And Professor Matuku just mentioned that ah, we still in some places use we are our bouncing burner in there. And he said in their place he works with the village. They are also looking at let's not damage it because it costs money to change this filter. They provide. Not to provide, there is a system. Okay, you yeah. can now explain. Maybe we have a system 
You can see a basic that has been destroyed, you know. So build up of flammable vapors with 70% recirculation. So over time, heat can you know build up and then you can have a, an accident. So we're still on limitations of BSC. BSC needs to be tested and certified regularly to assure that they are providing the expected protection prior to service after repairs or relocation and then annually. So the engineers will come annually. When they do, they place, you know, a sign on it. They normally do that. So let's quickly look at chemical fuel goods. This has taken so much of our time because we also need it. Need it. So chemical fuel goods, here we also have our chemicals, work with our chemicals, is designed for use with chemicals, provides personal, personal protection through inward airflow. Usually, no That's the bottom line. No So 100% exhaust through hard ducting to exterior of the... Yes, there's, there's a ducting to exterior, but there's no defamation. So the gases just find their way. So how do you take advantage of other people if it is the air, the air, the fuel is? You say what I say in that case, how do we ensure that we protect other people of the environment if the fume is outside? Yes. How you protect those who are working with it depends on the chemicals that you're using. That's why the environmental impact assessment is important. If you're working in an organization, you must there are agencies that you must present the certificate of environmental impact assessment. So when you do that, they must know the impact of that chemical to the environment and then say that. So that's how. How is it depends on what you're working with. It depends on the environmental impact assessment, the outcome of that assessment. It will guide them on what to do about that, you know, chemical thing that is going outside. Because they may also have some trappings outside that they will build beyond what is inside the establishment. But you can know Nigerians, like you always say, Nigerians, we are just too good in killing ourselves. A company will know that they are generating so much, you know, fumes that are environmentally toxic, and they just put put the edge of out there. And as a community with their river, they will pour the air into the water. I don't understand our people. We, we, we still have uh, many years to go. And then the people that are supposed to be regulators will go for less of them below that way. Yes, I'm so, <laughs> so let's look at this. Uh, yes, the environmentalists, tell me about it. You know, it's like uh, what uh, Namu used to say mm -hmm. ourselves. Uh, yes. We are generators. Why do you do the most? How do you control the school? The generator? In your house. But the small generator in the house, it has killed people now that because of this, they left it inside. Yes. And if it was yes. we left it inside the house, yes. the whole family died. Yes. No, yes. They are teaching people. So we are advised to put it where they have more air, you know, the ventilation is better. Then some people will just put it by the corridor of their sitting room or their bedroom at the window. The side of the window. And they are sleeping inside. It's polluted. So let's look at clean beds or laminar flow hood. You can see the man walking on a just a laminar flow hood. Outward air flow is directed towards the workers' breathing zone. No personnel protection. Provide a sterile environment. Provide a sterile environment. Use primarily with non-hazardous material, like when you're preparing your ingredients. Okay. So 
So let's not spend time on this. So this risk assessment is, is very important in that what you do will depend on the level of risk, the outcome of the risk assessment that can be performed. So selecting ventilation equipment in your group will not do um, anything in our group. Hmm? Uh, we'll just uh, skip this. This is a group exercise. But let's do it together. What this exercise is about is for personal protection. Will you choose a class one, class two, A2, class two, B2, class three, clean bench, clean hood? So you will answer seven by seven. Will agree. For personal protection, will class one protect the person? Yes. Are we all saying yes? yes. Will class two A one protect the person? Yes. Class two uh, B two. Yes. Class three. Yes. Clean bench. No. Fume wood. Yes. 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 Provide personal protection. So, film hood, yes. So, for personal protection, most of it is yes, yes, yes. If you have that, you can mark it, mark it in your workbook. So, product protection, we have gone through this. Let us, class one, does it do product protection? We all agree. Class two, A2. Yes. Two, B2. Yes. Three. Yes. Clean bench. Yes. Fume wood. No. Ah. Product protection. Yes. Let's yes. see. Whether it's yes or no. Yes. This is this is fume wood. Usually it's a design for use with chemicals. Provide personal tool and protection. Usually don't put that. So uh -huh. So this film would now product protection. No. No. So, the product is the so this, in this case now, this is dicey. The product is the chemical. So it protects the chemical now. The product for the is the chemical. And it is designed to make you work. So if we take the assumption is that the product in food is the chemical. So if, if you work well and safely with chemicals using it, then it protects the very well. Yes. Just know that the product is not there, microbes. So who said yes that time? You said yes. Did you have one in mind? Yeah. Or you had microbes? <laughs> okay. So let's look at environmental protection. Class one, does it protect the environment? Class one. Class one, does it protect the environment? It does not protect the environment. No, I'm ready to see. It protects the environment. Wait, wait, let's look at class one. Hey, passes over the walking room. Exhaust air is never good at all according to the room. No product protection. I hope we do know that. Did you say anything about the environment? No. Because the air doesn't go out. The room is the environment. And then, unfiltered room air passes over the work area. Exhaust air is never filtered. When it is never filtered, what happens? It's clean. It's clean air coming back. So it protects the environment. That's why it's good that we think it's very well. So, so we continue. So class one protects the environment. Class two A two environment. Yes. yes. Environment in class two B two. Yes. Class three income. Yes. Clean bench does it protect the environment? No. Film hood does it protect the environment? No. 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 We don't do that. Don't agree here that this chemical go out. What happens there? I was saying they need to do environmental impact. So, ordinarily, 
is not protecting the environment. Then you need to have an additional mitigation measure based on what kind of chemical is going out there. So the, the equipment on its own does not protect the environment. So let's look at large amounts of chemical use. When you're using large amounts, you remember class one, does it? Can you deal with large amounts? No. What of class two? Large amounts of chemical? No. Class two, B2? Yes. Large amounts. Wait, we are here. Hold on, hold on, class. Hold on, class. Let's start with uh, class two, class two, class two, A2. Read the last one. It says, if they are exhausted through proper, uh, no, my minute. 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 So two B two is a no. Yeah. So let's go to two, two A two. Let's go to two B two. Say the quantity. With volatile toxic chemicals. So two B two for work concentration. What's what? Yeah. Yeah. So this may be used for work with volatile toxic yeah. chemicals yeah. and residue. Yeah. So they were silent yeah. or yeah. 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 negative. Let's think through it. This engineering uh, equipment, is it really meant for chemicals, working with chemicals, for you to bring large And we were able to bring alcohol that small. In fact, sometimes it can be explosive. So you say no. So let's, uh, let's go through that route. So where else do you have large chemical? Carry your wire and go to the chemical we'll room. Build box. So we'll go back. No. Large amount. So clean bench. Can you work with chemical on the bench? No. no. Class three. He said, "What is it? Yes. No. Then fume good. Yes. 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 Small amounts of chemical use. You already know the answer. Class one. Can you work with chemical? Then no. no. Class two A two. Yes. Class two B two. Yes. Class three. Yes. Yes. Class three. Did they mention something about chemical? No. no. Didn't see anything. They were silent on chemical. So the pass is for two way. It's the pass for three. Assumption. You know that something the president used to say. He said assumption is the mother of all. It's a sign. Now from the back, I get a sign. It's 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 a no, class three is an improvement. An improvement on yes. and it's a small amount. You are trying to justify it, yes. and it's a small amount. And class three is supposed to be an improvement yes. on two. So we are closing our eyes to yes. assume. One thing you should know is that the yes. air flow of class two and three they are not really the same. Air comes from the so are you what what are you saying? Yes. Yes. You're so saying yes. No, that when you're working with small amount of chemical, that we can use. What I'm saying, class three can be used. Can be used. That's what he's saying. That class three cannot be used. Do you, do you know another thing we should also think about when we look at class three? There is something they said. Is, is, no, there's something I want to bring up here in class Class three. You see, maximum containment, gas tight enclosure with global. If you carry a mechanical thing, you see why we need to think before we answer. There are things that may not be on the slide. When we think about it, it's time, it's an inclusion. Anything chemical could be dangerous. And that's why they were silent. They didn't tell us here that we can work with chemicals. All right? So the assumption goes, it's a force. Yes, for our own safety. All right. So we go back to our table. I think we are done. So for clean bed, small amount of chemicals. Can you work on a clean bed? Yes. Small amount of chemicals. Small amount of chemicals. And then feel good. Yes. All right. I thank for everyone.
So let's quickly go to certificate uh, safety because we need to run to the next uh, module. So for your centrifuge, you're looking at your centrifuge. Centrifuge safety. Are we all used to centrifuges? You know, some people don't work in the lab. Is there anybody that has not seen a centrifuge here? Have we all seen centrifuges? And we know that they are different pockets. So you have to follow for centrifuge safety. You know, it's an equipment that rotates at high speed. You can set the speed depending on what you're trying to separate. Follow recommended maintenance schedules. Balance the rotors carefully. For you to use a centrifuge, I remember when we were students of medical lab, we would just come, we would put one tube here. That time we are still learning to balance. Uh, <laughs> So you, when you put one tube here, yeah, you will just put any hand. Say, oh, we have space. You put it anyhow, then you just start it. The whole thing will just break. Wow. So you need to balance. That's why, you know, for those who are not using now that uh, the students still make those mistakes. You know, once you learn to balance the rotor, you know, you have to focus like that. Uh -huh. So never defeat safety interlocks. And you can see, you for a centrifuge, it's additional safety to have that covers for the bigger ones. The smaller ones just have the general, you know, uh, cover. Wash rotors with mild detergent. Never harsh or caustic cleaners. Never use abrasive or stiff brushes. Allow rotors to air dry outside or upside down <laughs> before placing in the cold. Okay. This is simple, we don't need to spend time here. And then we're still talking about centrifuge safety here. Routinely, they contaminate rotors and centrifuge. Some people, if you go to some labs, things will break inside the centrifuge. They will just remove that and leave the, the contents of the container that broke there. It will dry inside. These are practices that, that you know professionals also do, not even those who are not uh, certified. They have license to practice, and yet they are doing nonsense. Routinely, they contaminate rotors and uh, interiors, appropriate. It's appropriate disinfectant. Then use secondary safety cups. You can see the secondary safety cup now to cover it in case of spillages, in case of splashes, you know, when spinning infectious materials. And when you're spinning and it stops, you give it some time to stop completely before you, you open. We are still looking at the safety. You load and load rotors and safety cups for any infectious materials inside the PSC. You load it inside the PSC. Wipe off the outside of each secondary container with a suitable disinfectant. These are good laboratory practices. Then, this is an exercise that we will do in plenary. A high speed centrifuge exploded in your lab. How would you respond? Is that <laughs> no, it's a big centrifuge. It's a big, it's a big one, like the one they use in clinics, in watch, you know. Or maybe bigger factories. So, how would you respond? I'm going to write this on, on, on. Take your sticky notes. This centrifuge was exploded in your lab. Begin to think now. How would you respond? A high speed centrifuge exploded. What would you do? How would you respond? I want you to write how you would respond. And I'm going to take your sticky notes. One answer per sticky notes. You had a bit like a bomb. You know this thing. You don't see more than like a bomb. So, 
I can even write it. You tell me and I'll write it. You have an explosion. Wow. You're walking in the lab and then suddenly. So table one, how would you respond? Switch off the appliance. Switch off the appliance. From the power source. Switch off power source. Use they didn't tell us whether they are inspired. Table <laughs> two. Isolate the section. Isolate the section. Okay. So when you say isolate the section, are you saying evacuate? No. Evacuate. Evacuate. <laughs> Ah, what's the spelling of code? Somebody spell it. C O D O L E. No E. There's no E. There's no E. I wrote it that I'm looking at it. Is there E? Yes, it depends. Okay, C O R. Okay, we are in grammar class now. Go down. We need to get the correct. Go down now. C O R or C O so what is missing here is I should remove the E. Yes. C O R C O N. Hold on up. affected area. Okay. There's an explosion in our lab about that. Table three. What you okay? You have given us table three. Clean all spills. Eh? All spills. Clean up all spills. What do you do before you clean? You remove the rotor and this of rotor and. We already we are assume that we have already one of our two Huh? We are assume that we are we already in our two PPE because in the lab okay we are already in our two. Don't assume. Put on PPE. Put on PPE. Yeah. That's true. Then four, the contaminants. Five, after that, you can now clean a bit. So you, you, you now clean, you know, um, pick up the solids before you go to the... Or you have to evacuate before you clean. Yeah. 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 So clean up. All right. I can't all of you. Yeah. 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 Yes, you have to fill your parents for in quality management system. Yeah. And you have to also do some risk communication. Uh documentation. You document occurrence. Yeah. And then there's something important here. We are not in QMS, but it's also good to do a root cause analysis. Do a yeah. root cause. Do a root cause. Because this root cause will help you to know what mitigation measures when you have a life. So we have done the exercise. Then, um, back for vacuum line uh, protection, protect all vacuum lines with traps and hydrophobic filters, change high use filters every six months. So important thing is that whenever you have filters, you know, always make sure routine checks and it's changed as at when due. Okay. So transport containers that you use to carry samples from one area to the other. You have to have a robust, slick proof, unbreakable, autoclavable containers 
also used to transport the infectious material within the lab facilities. Load and unload in the BSC, we said it before, and have to wipe the serial with appropriate disinfectant. Autoclave in between uses. The autoclave in between uses. Sufficient absorbent should be present at the bottom. At the bottom, you can see the transport container. So we are rounding up now as we are looking at identifying problems. What is wrong with this picture? What will happen? If so, so what will you make mention of people still using some archaic, yeah. you know? So can you can relate to this archaic box, wooden box. What is the result of using this wooden box? What results can you get? So, somebody using still sticking to 19 3D uh, kind of equipment. Mm -hmm. So the likelihood of infection will be very high. The likelihood of contamination will be high. And then you will not be able to, you know, clean this. Because it's absorbed, it can absorb you know, uh, material. That wood can absorb material. So what is the assumed risk here? What is the assumed risk? We've already talked about the high risk of infection. So, and it will fire because wood can catch fire. And that's why that, I don't know how they are going to deal with that stupid girl. Because she went to the, the supermarket and went to where they had lighters. No, no, no. Let her plant. Eh? That's when they took to the and the They said they were packs of light. Oh, yes. The the is in the So they are sending it at No, no, she wrote. Let her operate inside. She went there. 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 So engineering controls, we're trying to identify problem with this. What is wrong with this picture? What's wrong with this picture? You can see a BSC. There's a door. And look at the look at the vents right on top of the BSC. So it's what we talked about. It's going to affect the air flow. Because look at it. And it's so close to the door. So people walk in, walk out. I'm telling you. So fixing the problem. You see how they moved the BSC away from the door. And moved the vent too, a little bit away from the entrance of the BSC. Hmm? So this is the same machine that data set up. That's the vent for the BSC. The other one is for the room. So look at this too, identifying the problem. What went wrong with this picture? This is our an uh, clean. You can see the plaster on the auto plate, brown. It's an old one. They don't have money to buy new ones. And what can happen to this? And you're trying to use it to sterilize material. Can it align well? So will you have that sterilization? No. The answer is no. So the assumed risk is what? High risk of infection and exposure to community. Because when you auto clean, Contaminated materials. The assumption is that it is free yes. of um, biological legends. Then you can the cleaner will carry it and go and put in the general doctor. Meanwhile, you didn't achieve that because this auto plate is not working. So the environment gets contaminated. So on that note, as a review, let us discuss what we have learned about engineering controls and lab equipment. What did we learn? Please let me ask one Coming out could have some 
เอเจนต์เฟอร์มาเอฟอร์มาเอฟอร์มาเอฟอร์มาเอฟอร์มาเอฟอร์มาเอฟอร์มาเอฟอร์มาเอฟอร์มาเอฟอร์มาเอฟอร์มาเอฟอร์มาเอฟอร์มาเอฟอร์มาเอฟอร์มาเอฟอร์มาเอฟอร์ That you are saying that additional measure could be to open the windows just in case. That's what you're saying, right? But if you, you ask me, provided they have been held, no one documented, and you know people that manufacture from this equipment, they don't just manufacture because they want to make money. There are tests, tests that they do to certify that this is fit for office before they have it. And you know they know that people will be using it to s t e r i l i z e and they are not also supposed to expose those people to danger. So I want to believe that the makers of those equipment must have put into consideration what you are saying. And also, uh, most of those media officials, mm. in ideally, there should be odor extractor. Mm. So when those odors come, the extractors will pull the p a r s and so the people at the immediate places they are. Safe. But most of the places we have, those things are bad. Mm -hmm. So the others come out, it goes to the mainland, and everybody runs. Just like literally, what is going to be the problem? In terms of what's going to be, so if I did this many, there is a particular agent, and you're giving us she has answered that question. So I read it. Yeah, it doesn't mean infection. Yeah, it doesn't mean infection. The smell. The smell. But if you're passing a dumpster site and you're perceiving. Order from it. No, no, inside is all sorts of jams there. So I can say, uh, the gas. We sell the gas from it. But uh, so from aerosol, Greece will carry aerosol from there as you're passing it. Uh, uh, when you compare it to this autoclave, I'm like a bit skeptical about autoclave. You think that. Is already on that, and before that, he gets to a certain temperature. Before that, s t i l l can't s t a n So, what does it mean to us? Engineering controls in the hierarchy of mitigation. We are trying to look at mitigation strategies, and we've identified engineering control is high up there after elimination and substitution. Then you have engineering control. You know that's so important. It means that it's important that we pay attention. Because if your BSc fails, fail certification. If your centrifuge is having problem, when we are doing safety audits, there are it's not every lab equipment that we look at. We go straight to those equipment that are primary containment. You know that we use the primary containment and then secondary containment. So we do that for h a n d b a s i n s and check the conditions on things that you have to do. So it's not every about every thing. We're talking about safety and security. So engineering controls is looking at. All those equipment that you use for primary containment of the agents that you're working with, where do we go from here? It's making sure, sorry, sir. It's making sure that as we leave this place, we will have an attitudinal change, a mindset. You know, safety is everybody's business. Making sure that engineering controls within where you work are functioning the way they are designed to function. Is everybody in business? That's what we're saying. Now we are ready. 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 Let me answer. He said you should think about it. We have just looked at this engineering control, and we see that when you can do the PSC, the centrifuge, the other equipment, in the laboratory. That we use too. Like which one? What about the water or the vapor? What about? I think we should also look at those capabilities and how they could go wrong. So, not to limit the doors by safety and centrifuge. We have a hotel, a l i t e t o r a w a t e r park, and the laboratory. Exactly. Even if they are not for private e n t e r t a i n m e n t then they are also important. 
every equipment that you use. And that is where your good laboratory practice also comes in. It's an extension. So you look at every equipment. So we are going to um, go to the next module now. Then we need to recap our key message. And I want somebody from table one to read point number one. Our treatment facilities and equipment establish and maintain primary and secondary barriers. Mm -hmm. Primary barriers contain the agent that is source. Mm -hmm. Secondary barriers protect personnel mm -hmm. or the environment in case of the use of primary content. Mm -hmm. Okay, so table two, the next bullet. <laughs> When you stop it, that's the key word. Level three. Oh, yeah. Secondary controls must be maintained for property. Level four. There are a variety of equipment and the sign equals that the five components in the environment. Understanding their function is key to performance. Mm -hmm. Understanding their function is key to performance. So you have your learning contracts, the action plan, and thank you for listening. <laughs> we, we are tama in our training. There is a there is prop because this uh, you need manufacturers uh, manual to operate this is uh, laptop. <laughs> I'm telling you, this is one day. No, 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 why don't you see it? Let me use one Let me use one strong. Hello. Wait, I don't know this uh, what the obviously uh just uh I don't know what I don't know. I'll see what I'm in.
and validating standard operating procedures. Developing, evaluating, and validating standard operating procedures. Like present products in the morning, we have to do and take note of our contract. What do you think you want to know? About this module, what do you want to know? And when we are going through the module, how would you like to feel? How will you feel? Then, what will you be able to do? So you write it down. Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So, but by the way, when as we finish the um, engineering controls, if you were telling me to. Uh, your action plan. No fail do. Let's take the key messages. The point somebody on the phone will help us read the key message. The first one. Okay, so we'll take care of that. See, um, a special part of that uh, um, PBS is here in inverted commas. SOPs are instructional documents designed to guide different people doing one thing the same way and achieving the same outcome. Good to SOPs are generally designed to achieve a single or small outcome. For example, correctly disposing of laboratory waste. For example, what should I do with this collaboration? Okay, so generally designed to achieve a single or small outcome. For example, correctly disposing of collaboration based. For example, what should I do with this contaminated glove? Group three. Yeah, there are many acceptable ways to arrive an SOP, I think I can and this should be. However, there are key components that can compromise an effective enterprise. Compromise. So there are many acceptable ways to write an SOP. However, there are key components that comprise an effective um, SOP. So we shall see those key components before. The design SOP can be used for developing biorisk management systems. 
So we design SOP templates that we use, what it will be, queries, whatever SOP is. So, group, uh, group five. SOPs must be evaluated and validated to assure that individuals can understand and physically accomplish the procedure and that all individuals are accomplishing the intended outcome of the SOP. So, the they will be evaluated to ensure that all individuals are accomplishing the same, the intended as for the SOP. Now, the sixth one to consistently measure the ongoing effectiveness of an SOP, the general observation data metrics can be used, and SOPs will be reviewed periodically and revise as needed. I'm sure we are pulling for it. Again, the AMP model applies assessment, mitigation, and then performance. What is an SOP? What does SOP stand for? What is an SOP? When do you need an SOP? How do you know if an SOP is working? The other competitors in various groups, then we just share and we promote.
the, the first one is what does SOP stand for? I think all the groups, um, all the groups have said something that appear to be similar. So we have SOP is standard operating procedure. So all the five groups uh, have similar answer to that. Then what is an SOP? Because it's a guide to carry out lab procedures. Not only really lab. Eh? Okay, so we should rule the lab. Then Ruthie says an SOP is an who is it? Group two. Please, this is your this is your number. Is the number one. 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 <laughs> we are just on the day. Okay, she's got nothing for Ah, group two. I, I don't have you know, the team back. Okay, that, that's why you're able to get uh, engaged in the lot of Okay, still group two. I'm afraid now. Is it SOP? Please, um, last call. Please just settle that. I think, I think the people can, the people can move from table to table. Okay. Yeah. SOP is a step by step instruction. instruction. Compiled to be used in the lab for routine operations. <laughs> now, does anyone have anything like this? Yes, not only in the lab. Not only in the lab. Okay. <laughs> eh? <laughs> eh, okay. <laughs> okay. Is there one of those that are not routine? <laughs> Okay, so, so we, we are we are exploiting uh, that specific uh, this in here to, to, to lab and then we see the procedure. Group four. Take my car 
for something, something for service. For service. Because you are sure you should do that once in a while. No, when I can now say when something happens. So if this particular thing happens, this is what I do. Why did it say come? That's a research laboratory. You may not have to follow routine procedures depending on what you are set out to achieve in that research. An example is this for routine histological studies, for example, you use tomatoes like that you have seen. Are you with me? And then you follow either. Either uh, regressive staining or progressive staining. In which case, you will, in the case of regressive staining, you will first have to overstay and then you now begin to wash back. You understand? Whereas in progressive staining, you continue to stain and get deeper concentration of the stain. Now, that is what is expected in routine histological procedure. But when you have a particular purpose in research, you might not have to follow the two processes. In which case, the SOP does describe that deep in state for 10 minutes. It doesn't matter whether it has overstayed or has understated. In that case, that is no longer a routine practice. If you understand. So I think the reason why we are focusing on the routine thing here is that we are looking mostly at the clinical laboratory or diagnostic laboratory and not considering in research or research situation. So in that case, therefore, I will say more that we do not include the word routine. In this, so that we do not exclude focus from some other procedures that allow us. That exactly. Thank you. We did it out. Okay, we took us here. All right, so uh, two is still living. All right, before um, documented processes put in place to ensure that services and products are delivered consistently anytime. Service and products. Yes. Yes. Group five. Instructional document designed to guide to guide to achieve a specific objective. Agree? Now we to um, when do you need an SOP? Kupon says needed every time procedures are carried out. Group two, SOP is needed in all laboratory procedures. Yes. Correct? Yes. 
Verse 3 says, when while writing, um, you know, while working in the lab, um, uh, I don't get this. Or when, to, when training intakes for other students to maintain standards in the laboratory for quality control and to maintain safety. Okay? Reform. We need an SOP when carrying, a, when carrying out the procedure. Revive when different individuals need to achieve the same result, doing the same thing. All right. <laughs> so all the all the answers are correct, right? Yes. Okay. How do you know if an SOP is working? Report says auditing reproduce result on a sample in another lab. Okay. So that's my uh, expert. Uh, okay. Yeah, the file is putting that. So that does not flow. Okay, give us, give us. Uh, no, our answer is there. <laughs> <laughs> it's the answer now to the, the, the ghost answer. <laughs> We are saying that taking, taking whatsoever to an external laboratory may not be suitable because the SOP is to achieve a known end, except for research purposes, where even at that time an end is expected, the researcher may or may not look. It's different. But for operations that the end is known already, you don't need to take it outside to confirm that. As long as you achieve what you intend to achieve, then that SOP is fine. Not necessarily taking out. Evaluating your SOP during use does it give you the same result all the time as an laboratory? So you don't need that. No, 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 you don't need that
things that I want to do is peculiar thing, and this one is that different people use the same method and obtain the same things out of That is what is very important. So, even within the same laboratory, if five persons are in the laboratory, transfer no that pattern and obtain the same result. I also want to remind us that every equipment comes with manufacturer's instructions. Yeah. And it is from here most of the things that we are lifted. So if you follow the manufacturer's instructions, you must get the same platform. So I'm not surprised that you're taking the other lab here because you can get something. That's what we are saying. Okay. That's it. What I just want to say is that maybe five of us here run a uh, sample, maybe PCB, fastest one. We all got 55%. Then actually, it's supposed to be 10%. Does that mean we have our procedures here? Okay. No, no, no. You have not followed the SOP correctly. <laughs> He's getting the to the 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 the
for me to, to, to be able to get a result that is predictable. Predictability means what? You must be able to estimate standard error. Uh, what the what is the average of the sharp things? So it doesn't mean that you must get the same thing. Uh, and I can we had that argument. I say you don't need it's not all tasks that you need to be safety, physical tasks, tasks that you require accuracy, safety, and you need to produce standardized results. So for example, if I said I said, why would you waste your time producing an SOP for how whether a man will enter the lab? Backwards. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 about taking tests outside of the test. Okay, then, the essence of what we are talking about here is that we listen to so let me When we say, how do you know if an SOP is working? This presupposes, let's listen to that. This presupposes that the use of the SOP has um, you know, the same condition, the same place, and then everything is the same. Then it's expected that all those who eventually um, did the work followed the same procedure under the same condition and all the very work. Now, and um, how do you know if an SOP is working? Well, of, of course, if people, those who are um, actually doing the task, as we continue in the module, we begin to see some other, um, some other conditions um, that we need to apply. For instance, um, are there people that have been so trained in the experience in that? Aspect to use that procedure, or someone came in and began to use the procedure when the person is not adequately trained to carry out that task. They're very, very, they're very important. We're here, we're not looking at how do we know if an SOP is working. Of course, if everybody is using the same SOP and then we're not arriving at different results, it means that uh, the SOP, and um, it means that there is something that, that we need to do, and that's why. Um, for well, someone, the group of nurses auditing, how do you know if an SOP is, is working? That's the auditing. In what sense are you applying auditing here? Auditing the process that gives you the result. Okay. Okay. Let me just let me just move from that uh, before I go to book two. He said, "How do you know if an SOP is working?" He said, "When results are reproducible." That's true. Book two. When results are reproducible. In other words, when results are not reproducible, it means that the SOP is not working. It may also mean that the SOP was also scientifically followed. It could also mean that. Yes. They are not really that because yes, everybody followed the SOP. Yeah. Okay. I think that's where we're going to be possible in achieving the results. We are seeing that we are assuming that all these sorts of errors are going to happen. How do we overcome all these sorts of errors? We expect that if the SOP is one, two businesses using it, it will be the same. So if they don't, if, if 
the results are not reproducible. Having considered all this calibration, so the SOP is not working. So that takes us back to the, uh, what uh, do you want to say? Okay. If what is, is done is what is splitting. <laughs> I think uh, it's uh, actually um, a presentation from the I told you, we are talking about the fact that the SOP is already there. It is what is written that is also being done. So the assumption here is that already what is written is what is being known. We will accept the, uh, the aspect of your uh, the possibility of results. That is the second one. The second one is based on the, on the fact that you are doing what is accelerating. Now, before, by assessing the outcome of the process, mm. by assessing the outcome of the process, is it it's not qualified? Assessing to achieve what? Ah, you ask me. Ah, you ask me. Ah, you ask me. Ah, you ask me. Ah, you you qualify it now that the outcome is consistent. Yes. Yes. Okay, so fine. When the desired outcome is consistently achieved. Yes. So we take that. Yes. All right. Thank 
We're going to do a little exercise now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
with the SOP and for their discipline. We know what this is just a demonstration to actually to actually let us know that when we do not have um, details, some, some more details of what our um, staff, their subordinates, or those who are, who are doing uh, the procedure, if we do not have such specific details, that someone you know, can do it the way he or she understands. That's what I'm saying. So at the end, we will get to a more, um, say, um, a more defined, a more perfected SOP. All right, so then the goal of an SOP is different people doing the same thing and getting the same result. Testing an SOP. So we we'll say that uh, we understood, we understood uh, a bit what an SOP is. The question there is could you do physically? Could you physically do what the SOP has? Was the outcome the intended outcome? The different individuals achieve the same outcome? We talk about Yeah, we just carry me what the SOP has. Yes, okay. well, was the outcome the intended uh, the intended outcome? We don't know. We didn't know the intended outcome. So we just follow that. Of course, at the end, all we knew was that at the end of it. Now, okay. Assuming we, we look at the the protocol as we read before, and then we saw that towards the end, we'll have to tear off you know, a corner of it and then open our eyes. So the out <laughs> the outcome, even if um, even if um, the it's not saying that we have um, a similar outcome, I mean fully that we say. But at least we, we know that at the end of it. We are supposed to have a part of the paper at all. Right? Yeah. What we didn't know is actually you know how we can all have similar pattern of um, the top paper, right? Yeah. The SOP was not specific. It was not specific. It's not so what we did. What we did here was Okay, so from uh, what we did, of course, it's obvious that we did we did not achieve the same outcome. Okay, and this will be this um, instructional document. Many of us wrote that here. Now, instructional documents teach a reader to understand a rule of principle. The second one is that the instructional document will envision a process or workflow. Perform a task, use a tool. We agree. We all agree. Now, here, instead of instructional documents, are reader centered rather than rule center. Let's go to the next slide. And then we're going to look at what are some of the things that constitute instructional documents. So we have policy, 
program plan that we have to see them. So in policy, we're looking at a plan or guiding principle that influences other actions. Later we will look at you know, uh, the differences. Okay? So in program plan, we have a set of tasks or actions performed in a specified sequence or manner that achieves a particular result. Finally, for procedure, we have a specific task, work instruction or action. The procedures may include steps or actions. An example of policy. Dispose of biologically contaminated waste according to local regulation. So that's like that's like a policy. So we can say in our facility here, it is our policy that we must dispose all biologically contaminated waste according to local regulation. My question now will be, who writes this document? Just answer in the plenary. So who writes this document? The user. The user. The user. The end is policy. We are dealing with policy now. Okay. Suppose said management. Other said the military body. Some said end is <laughs> look at look at what look at this instruction document. We said what policy is. Policy is a plan or guiding principle that influences other actions. Regulatory body. I think the management should constitute a team that will look at that so that in such a way that it doesn't see what they come from now influences the field that is not, not necessarily management. The management can supersede the production of that document so long as it is produced by professionals who know what that thing is all about. Okay, in, in, in facilities, in institutions, in establishment, who issues policy statement? The management. I don't believe for policy, policy. Yeah. Yeah. Sir, what are the things that we're looking at? Even management is influenced by higher authority yes. that directs them to do such things. So at the end of the day, it could be the Ministry of Health in the state, Ministry of Health in the country, the Ministry of Health in various places. We extract some of the documents from uh, maybe um, West Africa uh, yes. organization. Those ones will also extract from a higher body. So, honestly, uh, I have to do it. Yeah, okay. Now, now um, I, I, I really appreciate all the, all the contribution. If we go back to example of policy, dispose of biologically contaminated waste according to local regulations. Of course, local regulations can be, you know, reg regulations that have, been, that have been produced um based on you know extant or existing laws i, I follow you yes. so if they are producing such um regulations 
When we now come to our local organizations, I follow you So now pronounce that as policy, uh, to make policy statement in our local opposition. I think it's a uh, duty of either top management or middle left management, depending on the scenario that we are and uh, that we are actually um, you know uh, facing. I feel it done. So who writes the document? Who is the audience? You don't think so? No, so who are uh, who is the audience? So the policy is actually talking to the maybe middle level managers or managers that will extract the SOP. Let, let's let's give the example here. That's what we have to plan. The example here says it's disposed of biologically contaminated waste according to local regulations. Who writes this document for the to establish that? And then who is the audience from this from this if I, if I want to answer this question, and I want to put the scenario of my own facility into this context, I will say the top management, the CMP, and other hierarchies, they have generated the policy. And so they are talking to my head of department or the head of the scientist in my department to make sure that all biological agents were appropriately decontaminated. And so it now becomes the business of the head of the department, you know, maybe instructing the head of the scientist to please draft an SOP and ensure that some individuals are designated to achieve that. So the policy, if the audience of the policy does not, you know, have the end users do not now necessarily need to be the audience of the policy. The SOP is what should be addressed to the, the end users. To the end users. That's the SOP is what we need. That policy is sometimes, 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 sometimes the part of the management and some SOP is the policy. Okay, so, so the end users are the audience. Yes, sir. Okay. First of all, I want to say if there is a problem, it is the person that you do not do what it is supposed to I think that. The real end users of this document, the audience, is the person that has the capacity to dispose of the company the West. That's what I think. The person that has the capacity is to the company the West. They are told you that there is a regulation. That's the one to Okay, sir. At this level, what I'm not talking about like SOP here, but Exactly. Exactly. So that Okay, please, so that uh, we move on here. We have this example policy, and that's a policy statement. Dispose of politically contaminated waste according to local regulations. 
who writes this document, I live on Puerto Madrid, the top management or uh, middle level management. Who is the audience? All those who are involved in either generating or handling or disposing political waste. They are all those are each as an audience. And then what is the intended purpose? The intended purpose is this one. The intended purpose exactly. is to make sure that all biologically contaminated waste are disposed according to regulation. I don't know that whether we are we are safe. Now another example. Program plan. Now we had policy statement. That we had policy program plan. We had our procedure. In order to dispose of contaminated waste appropriately, the following must be in place. For example, method of final decontamination and disposal. Are we together? Method of transport from point of generation to point of final decontamination and disposal. Label waste containers, label or colored waste bags, training for all roads involved in waste disposal, etc. Along with the details required for each of the above to be in place and then effective. Has anyone any issues with all of us? All right. In order to dispose of contaminated waste appropriately, the following must be in place. Are we there? For example, it's a part of what we read before. And then we, we have so who writes the document, who is the audience, there was the intended uh, purpose in this material. The next example, procedure. To dispose of contaminated laboratory waste, we need to take the following actions. Who writes this document? Well, proceed now. Who is the audience? What is the intended problem? Well, um, I'm just um, saying that who writes the document? Who writes the document? Yeah. Well, in this context, it may depend. If you are thinking of the laboratory, maybe the laboratory manager. If you are thinking of the clinic, maybe. The, 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 if I think of the ward, maybe the ward manager. If you are thinking of the cleaning, maybe the head nurse in the cleaning. But then, who is the audience? The end users, maybe the cleaner and all the rest. Now, what is the intended purpose? The purpose is to ensure that waste were, you know, contaminated waste were appropriately disposed. That's my opinion. Okay. Are we looking at just biomedical waste or other waste? No, I'm not using examples that is regular. Okay. 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 Okay.
Yeah, well, my full name is uh, uh, so let's let's concentrate on those uh, from okay. 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 So who writes this document? The laboratory manager. Yeah. So if, if so, if you have a safety advisory officer, yes. you can be part of it. Yes. Hello, sir. Yes. You can, sorry, you can instruct the one of the editors to write. Yes, then it just for the manager to So it doesn't here. Yeah, I, I think uh, we are looking at, of course, um, we can have inputs, but someone thinks that it will be for. Well, if it is the laboratory we're referring to, the duty of SOP generation is in the purview of the laboratory manager. If it's a safety issue, the safety officer in conjunction with the laboratory manager. And when all those documents have been written, if there is a pathologist in that laboratory, it now becomes the duty of the pathologist to read through it and be sure it's fine and then it's signed off for use. That's the process. So I think you know so just to get the past control, the question is who likes documents. From my own perspective, I think people that my document is easier for me. I don't know. Who writes it? Like in my facility, you just instruct you. I need a procedure for PCB. You double PC. Things like that. Why do they all generate it? It now comes on the table. You are the one who that was right. You are not expected to generate all of it. Yeah, okay. So of course, we are we are looking at we are looking at the ownership of the document at this level. At this level, you can have people, you can have those who are informed, uh, those who are enlightened in this area, making uh, key views, and then uh, perhaps last of the conductor, but somebody takes responsibility at that level. That's what I'm saying. So who is the audience? Still all those who are involved in uh, disposing of the related laboratory waste. Who writes the documents? Who writes the documents? The the documents the documents is owned by the laboratory manager. Different sales may apply in different positions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry, good language practice. The QA officer would not write procedure for electrolyte UA and Gasoline. Who is an experienced person 
after being grown through all the stages of laboratory practice, who is expected to have had understanding across board becomes the custodian. Yes, it is my duty to sign off some documents. I could say, oh, since you are the one, this document is coming from your area. Please write it for me. But then, if issues come up, nobody will talk to me. I will be addressed. So the lab manager, now when all those things are done, who is now the consultant? Now, the work of the quality officer is now to ensure that those documents were adhered to. And so everybody will have to be in copy of the document. So the quality officer's duty is not adopting, you know, it's not writing the document. Even though in some organizations, he may choose to write if he's experienced and his ability. But the duty lies on the laboratory man. Let's continue after lunch. Yeah, they are controlled Oh, yes. They are controlled So, this one that is the controller, that's like Sorry. The black one job has been the manual Like, take for instance, the middle of a person that page. The that the that is the that the that the the that the that the that, that, was, that, that was what I said. That was what I said that different scenarios may play out in different communities. There are, there are some communities where you don't have this clear cut being in Nigeria by a safety officer. So the rest of can fall deep on the overseeing staff. They have the, like, the lab quality. Yeah. So, so but where, where you have some um, um, some specific role assigned to um, maybe immediate um, sub managers in the lab. I don't know. Yeah. So you can see how such people that are experienced in those areas uh, producing the document. But when I said in terms of ownership, it is a lab manager that actually owns the at that level. Have our So to to just grab up this. So who is the one to send all those who are involved in the disposing automated laboratory waste? What is the intended purpose? Of course, to ensure that automated laboratory waste are disposed properly. So we'll end here. When we come back for lunch. <laughs>